encyclical letter, Pascendi Gratis, of our most holy Lord Pius X, by divine providence Pope, on the doctrines of the modernists. To the patriarchs, primates, archbishops, and other local ordinaries in peace and communion with the Apostolic See, Pope Pius X, Venerable Brethren, Health and the Apostolic Benediction. One of the primary obligations assigned by Christ to the office divinely committed to us of feeding the Lord's flock is that of guarding with the greatest vigilance the deposit of the faith delivered to the saints, rejecting the profane novelties of words and the gainsaying of knowledge falsely so-called. There has never been a time when this watchfulness of the supreme pastor was not necessary to the Catholic body. For owing to the efforts of the enemy of the human race, there have never been lacking, to quote St. Paul, men speaking perverse things, vain talkers and seducers, erring and driving into error. It must, however, be confessed that these latter days have witnessed a notable increase in the number of the enemies of the cross of Christ, who, by arts entirely new and full of deceit, are striving to destroy the vital energy of the Church, and as far as in them lies, utterly to subvert the very kingdom of Christ. Wherefore, we may no longer keep silence, lest we should seem to fail in our most sacred duty, and lest the kindness that in the hope of wiser counsels we have hitherto shown them should be set down to lack of diligence in the discharge of our office. Section heading, The Gravity of the Situation that we should act without delay in this matter is made imperative especially by the fact that the partisans of error are to be sought not only among the Church's open enemies, but what is to be most dreaded and deplored in our very bosom, and are the more mischievous the less they keep in the open. We allude, venerable brethren, to many who belong to the Catholic laity, and what is much more sad, to the ranks of the priesthood itself, who, animated by a false zeal for the Church, lacking the solid safeguards of philosophy and theology, nay more, thoroughly imbued with the poisonous doctrines taught by the enemies of the Church, and lost to all sense of modesty, put themselves forward as reformers of the Church. And forming more boldly into line of attack, assail all that is most sacred in the work of Christ, not sparing even the person of the Divine Redeemer, whom, with sacrilegious audacity, they degrade to the condition of a simple and ordinary man. Although they express their astonishment that we should number them amongst the enemies of the Church, no one will be reasonably surprised that we should do so if, leaving out of account the internal disposition of the soul, of which God alone is the judge, he considers their tenets, their manner of speech, and their action. Nor indeed would he be wrong in regarding them as the most pernicious of all the adversaries of the Church. For as we have said, they put into operation their designs for her undoing, not from without, but from within. Hence, the danger is present almost in the very veins and heart of the Church, whose injury is the more certain from the very fact that their knowledge of her is more intimate. Moreover, they lay the axe not to the branches and shoots, but to the very root, that is, to the faith and its deepest fibres. And once having struck at this root of immortality, they proceed to diffuse poison through the whole tree, so that there is no part of Catholic truth which they leave untouched, none that they do not strive to corrupt. Further, none is more skilful, none more astute than they, in the employment of a thousand noxious devices, for they play the double part of rationalist and Catholic, and this so craftily that they easily lead the unwary into error. And as audacity is their chief characteristic, there is no conclusion of any kind from which they shrink, or which they do not thrust forward with pertinacity and assurance. To this must be added the fact, which indeed is well calculated to deceive souls, that they lead lives of the greatest activity, of assiduous and ardent application to every branch of learning, 
and that they possess, as a rule, a reputation for irreproachable morality. Finally, there is the fact, which is all but fatal to the hope of cure, that the very doctrines have given such a bent to their minds that they, they disdain all authority and brook no restraint. And relying on, upon a false conscience, they attempt to ascribe to a love of truth that which is in reality the result of pride and obstinacy. Once, indeed, we had hopes of recalling them to a better mind, and to this end we first of all treated them with kindness as our children, then with severity, and at last we have had recourse, though with great reluctance, to public reproof. It is known to you, venerable brethren, how unavailing have been our efforts. For a moment they have bowed their head, only to lift it more arrogantly than before. If it were a matter which concerned them alone, we might perhaps have overlooked it, but the security of the Catholic name is at stake. Wherefore, we must interrupt a silence which it would be criminal to prolong, that we may point out to the whole Church, as they really are, men who are badly disguised. Section heading, <coughs> The Division of the Encyclical. It is one of the cleverest devices of the modernists, as they are commonly and rightly called, to present their doctrines without order and systematic arrangement, in a scattered and disjointed manner, so as to make it appear as if their minds were in doubt or hesitation, whereas in reality they are quite fixed and steadfast. For this reason, it will be of advantage, venerable brethren, to bring their teachings together here into one group, and to point out their interconnection, and thus to pass to an examination of the sources of the errors, and to prescribe remedies for averting the evil results. Part 1. Analysis of Modernist Teaching To proceed in an orderly manner in this somewhat abstruse subject, it must first of all be noted that the modernist sustains and includes within himself a manifold personality. He is a philosopher, a believer, a theologian, an historian, a critic, an apologist, a reformer. These roles must be clearly distinguished one from the other by all who would accurately understand their system and thoroughly grasp the principles and the outcome of their doctrines. Section heading, Agnosticism is Philosophical Foundation. We begin then with a philosopher. Modernists place the foundations of religious philosophy in that doctrine which is commonly called agnosticism. According to this teaching, human reason is confined entirely within the field of phenomena, that is to say, to things that appear, and in the manner in which they appear. It has neither the right nor the power to overstep these limits. Hence, it is incapable of lifting itself up to God, and of recognizing his existence even by means of visible things. From this it is inferred that God can never be the direct object of science, and that, as regards history, he must not be considered as an historical subject. Given these premises, everyone will at once perceive what becomes of natural theology, of the motives of credi credibility, of external revelation. The modernists simply sweep them entirely aside, they include them in intellectualism, which they denounce as a system which is ridiculous and long since defunct. Nor does the fact that the Church has formally condemned these portentous errors exercise the slightest restraint upon them. Yet the Vatican Council has defined, quote, If anyone says that the one true God, our Creator and Lord, cannot be known with certainty by the natural light of human reason, by means of the things that are made, let him be anathema." Unquote. And also, quote, if anyone says that it is not possible or not expedient that man be taught through the medium of divine revelation about God and the worship to be paid him, let him be anathema. Unquote. And finally, quote, 
If anyone says that divine revelation cannot be made credible by external signs, and that therefore men should be drawn to the faith only by their personal internal experience or by private inspiration, let him be anathema. Unquote. It may be asked, in what way do the modernists contrive to make the transition from agnosticism, which is a state of pure nescience, to scientific and historic atheism, which is a doctrine of positive denial? And consequently, by what legitimate process of reasoning they proceed from the fact of ignorance as to whether God has in fact intervened in the history of the human race or not, to explain this history, leaving God out altogether, as if he really had not intervened. Let him answer who can. Yet it is a fixed and established principle among them that both science and history must be atheistic, and within their boundaries there is room for nothing but phenomena. God and all that is divine are utterly excluded. We shall soon see clearly what, as a consequence of this most absurd teaching, must be held touching the most sacred person of Christ and the mysteries of his life and death and of his resurrection and ascension into heaven. Section heading, Vital Imminence. However, this agnosticism is only the negative part of the system of the modernists. The positive part consists in what they call vital imminence. Thus they advance from one to the other. Religion, whether natural or supernatural, must, like every other fact, admit of some explanation. But when natural theology has been destroyed and the road to revelation closed by the rejection of the arguments of credibility, and all external revelation absolutely denied, it's clear that this explanation will be sought in vain outside of man himself. It must therefore be looked for in man, and since religion is a form of life, the explanation must certainly be found in the life of man. In this way is formulated the principle of religious imminence. Moreover, the first actuation, so to speak, of every vital phenomenon, and religion, as noted above, belongs to this category, is due to a certain need or impulsion. But speaking more particularly of life, it has its origin in a movement of the heart, which movement is called a sense. Therefore, as God is the object of religion, we must conclude that faith, which is the basis and foundation of all religion, must consist in a certain interior sense, originating in a need of the divine. This need of the divine, which is experienced only in special and favorable circumstances, cannot of itself appertain to the domain of consciousness, but is first latent beneath consciousness, or to borrow a term from modern philosophy, in the subconsciousness, where also its root lies hidden and undetected. It may perhaps be asked how it is that this need of the divine which man experiences within himself resolves itself into religion. To this question, the modernist reply would be as follows. Science and history are confined within two boundaries, the one external, namely the visible world, the other internal, which is consciousness. When one or other of these limits has been reached, there can be no further progress, for beyond is the unknowable. In presence of this unknowable, whether it's outside man and beyond the visible world of nature, or lies hidden within the subconsciousness, the need of the divine inner soul which is prone to religion excites, according to the principles of fideism, without any previous advertence of the mind, excites a certain special sense, and this sense possesses, implied within itself, both as its own object and as its intrinsic cause, the divine reality itself, and in a way unites man with God. It is this sense to which modernists give the name of faith, and this is what they hold to be the beginning of religion. 
but we have not yet reached the end of their philosophizing, or, to speak more accurately, of their folly. Modernists find in this sense not only faith, but in and with faith, as they understand it, they affirm that there is also to be found revelation. For indeed, what more is needed to constitute a revelation? Is not that religious sense which is perceptible in the conscience, revelation, or at least the beginning of revelation? Nay, is not God himself manifesting himself, indistinctly, it's true, in the same religious sense to the soul? And they add, since God is both the object and the cause of faith, this revelation is at the same time of God and from God. That is to say, God is both the revealer and the revealed. From this, venerable brethren, springs that most absurd tenet of the modernists, that every religion, according to the different aspect under which it is viewed, must be considered as both natural and supernatural. It is thus that they make consciousness and revelation synonymous. From this, they derive the law laid down as the universal standard, according to which religious consciousness is to be put on an equal footing with revelation, and that to it all must submit, even the supreme authority of the Church, whether in the capacity of teacher or in that of legislator in the province of sacred liturgy or discipline. Section heading, Deformation of Religious History, the Consequence. In all this process, from which, according to the modernists, faith and revelation spring, one point is to be particularly noted, for it is of capital importance on account of the historico-critical corollaries which they deduce from it. The unknowable they speak of does not present itself to faith as something solitary and isolated, but on the contrary, in close conjunction with some phenomenon which, though it belongs to the realms of science or history, yet to some extent exceeds their limits. Such a phenomenon may be a fact of nature containing within itself something mysterious, or it may be a man whose character, actions and words cannot, apparently, be reconciled with the ordinary laws of history. Then faith, attracted by the unknowable, which is united with the phenomenon, seizes upon the whole phenomenon and, as it were, permeates it with its own life. From this, two things follow. The first is a sort of transfiguration of the phenomenon by its elevation above its own true conditions, an elevation by which it becomes more adapted to clothe itself with the form of the divine character which faith will bestow upon it, the second consequence is a certain disfiguration, so it may be called, of the same phenomenon, arising from the fact that faith attributes to it, when stripped of the circumstances of place and time, characteristics which it does not really possess. And this takes place especially in the case of the phenomena of the past, and the more fully in the measure of their antiquity. From these two principles, the modernists deduce two laws, which, when united with a third, which they have already derived from agnosticism, constitute the foundation of historic criticism. An example may be sought in the person of Christ. In the person of Christ, they say, science and history encounter nothing that is not human. Therefore, in virtue of the first canon deduced from agnosticism, Whatever there is in his history suggestive of the divine must be rejected. Then, according to the second canon, the historical person of Christ was transfigured by faith. Therefore, everything that raises it above historical conditions must be removed. Lastly, the third canon, which lays down that the person of Christ has been disfigured by faith, requires that everything should be excluded deeds and words and all else that is not in strict keeping with his character, condition and education and with the place and time in which he lived. A method of reasoning which is passing strange but in it we have the modernist criticism. It is thus that the religious sense 
which through the agency of vital immanence emerges from the lurking places of the subconsciousness is the germ of all religion and the explanation of everything that has been or ever will be in any religion. This sense, which was at first only rudimentary and almost formless, under the influence of that mysterious principle from which it originated, gradually matured with the progress of human life, of which, as has been said, it is a certain form. This, then, is the origin of all, even of supernatural religion. For religions are mere developments of this religious sense. Nor is the Catholic religion an exception. It's quite on a level with the rest. For it was engendered by the process of vital immanence, and by no other way, in the consciousness of Christ, who is a man of the choicest nature, whose like has never been nor will be. In hearing these things, we shudder indeed at so great an audacity of assertion and so great a sacrilege. And yet, venerable brethren, these are not merely the foolish babblings of unbelievers. There are Catholics, yea, and priests too, who say these things openly, and they boast that they're going to reform the church by these ravings. The question is no longer one of the old era which claimed for human nature a sort of right to the supernatural. It's gone far beyond that and has reached the point where it is affirmed that our most holy religion in the man Christ, as in us, emanated from nature spontaneously and of itself. Nothing assuredly could be more utterly destructive of the whole supernatural order for this reason, the Vatican Council most justly decreed, quote, If anyone says that man cannot be raised by God to a knowledge and perfection which surpasses nature, but that he can and should, by his own efforts and by constant development, attain finally to the possession of all truth and good, let him be anathema, unquote. Section Heading the origin of dogmas. So far, venerable brethren, there has been no mention of the intellect. It also, according to the teaching of the modernists, has its part in the act of faith, and it is of importance to see how. In that sense of which we have frequently spoken, since sense is not knowledge, they say God indeed presents himself to man, but in a manner so confused and indistinct that he can hardly be perceived by the believer. It is therefore necessary that a certain light should be cast upon this sense so that God may clearly stand out in relief and be set apart from it. This is the task of the intellect, whose office it is to reflect and to analyze. And by means of it, man first transforms into mental pictures the vital phenomena which arise within him and then expresses them in words. Hence the common saying of the modernists that the religious man must think his faith. The mind then, encountering this sense, throws itself upon it and works in it after the manner of a painter who restores to a greater clearness the lines of a picture that have been dimmed with age. The simile is that of one of the leaders of modernism. The operation of the mind in this work is a double one. First, by a natural and spontaneous act, it expresses its concept in a simple popular statement. Then, on reflection and deeper consideration, or as they say, by elaborating its thought, it expresses the idea in secondary propositions, which are derived from the first, but are more precise and distinct. These secondary propositions, if they finally receive the approval of the supreme magisterium of the Church, constitute dogma. We have thus reached one of the principal points in the modernist system, namely the origin and the nature of dogma. For they place the origin of dogma in those primitive and simple formulae which, under a certain aspect, are necessary to faith. For revelation to be truly such requires the clear knowledge of God in the consciousness. But dogma itself, they apparently hold, strictly consists in the secondary formulae. To ascertain the nature of dogma, 
we must first find the relation which exists between the religious formulas and the religious sense. This will be readily perceived by anyone who holds that these formulas have no other purpose than to furnish the believer with a means of giving to himself an account of his faith. These formulas, therefore, stand midway between the believer and his faith. In their relation to the faith, they are the inadequate expression of its object and are usually called symbols. In their relation to the believer, they are mere instruments. Section heading is evolution. Hence, it is quite impossible to maintain that they absolutely contain the truth. For insofar as they are symbols, they are images of truth, and so must be adapted to the religious sense in its relation to man. And as instruments, they are the vehicles of truth, and must therefore in their turn be adapted to man in his relation to the religious sense. But the object of the religious sense, as something contained in the absolute, possesses an infinite variety of aspects, of which now one, now another, may present itself. In like manner, he who believes can avail himself of varying conditions. Consequently, the formula which we call dogma must be subject to these vicissitudes and are therefore liable to change. Thus, the way is opened to the intrinsic evolution of dogma. Here we have an immense structure of sophisms which ruin and wreck all religion. Dogma is not only able, but ought to evolve and to be changed. This is strongly affirmed by the modernists and clearly flows from their principles. For amongst the chief points in their teaching is the following, which they deduce from the principle of vital imminence, namely, that religious formulas, if they are to be really religious and not merely intellectual speculations, ought to be living and to live the life of the religious sense. This is not to be understood to mean that these formulas, especially if merely imaginative, were to be invented for the religious sense. Their origin matters nothing, any more than their number or quality. What is necessary is that the religious sense, with some modification where needful, should vitally assimilate them. In other words, it is necessary that the primitive formula be accepted and sanctioned by the heart, and similarly, the subsequent work from which are brought forth the secondary formulas must proceed under the guidance of the heart. Hence it comes that these formulas, in order to be living, should be and should remain adapted to the faith and to him who believes. Wherefore, if for any reason this adaptation should cease to exist, they lose their first meaning and accordingly need to be changed. In view of the fact that the character and lot of dogmatic formulas are so unstable, it is no wonder that modernists should should regard them so lightly and in such open disrespect and have no consideration or praise for anything but the religious sense and for the religious life. In this way, with consummate audacity, they criticize the church as having strayed from the true path by failing to distinguish between the religious and moral sense of formulas and their surface meaning and by clinging vainly and tenaciously to meaningless formulas while religion itself is allowed to go to ruin. Blind they are, and leaders of the blind, puffed up with the proud name of science, they reach the, that pitch of folly at which they pervert the, the eternal concept of truth and the true meaning of religion. In introducing a new system in which they are seen to be under the sway of a blind and unchecked passion for novelty, thinking not at all of finding some solid foundation of truth, but despising the holy and apostolic tradition, they embrace other and vain, futile, uncertain doctrines, unapproved by the Church, on which, in the height of their vanity, they think they can base and maintain truth itself. That last bit was a quote from Pope Gregory XVI, 1834. Section heading the modernist as believer, individual experience and religious certitude. Thus far, venerable brethren, 
we have considered the modernist as a philosopher. Now, if we proceed to consider him as a believer, I seek to know how the believer, according to modernism, is marked off from the philosopher. It must be observed that although the philosopher recognizes the reality of the divine as the object of faith, still, this reality is not to be found by him but in the heart of the believer, as an object of feeling and affirmation, and therefore confined within the sphere of phenomena. But the question as to whether in itself it exists outside that feeling and affirmation is one which the philosopher passes over and neglects. For the modernist believer, on the contrary, is an established and certain fact that the reality of the divine does really exist in itself and quite independently of the person who believes in it. If you ask on what foundation this assertion of the believer rests, he answers, in the personal experience of the individual. On this head, the modernists differ from the rationalists only to fall into the views of the Protestants and pseudo-mystics. The following is their manner of stating the question. In the religious sense, one must recognize a kind of intuition of the heart which puts man in immediate contact with the reality of God and infuses such a persuasion of God's existence and his action both within and without man as far to exceed any scientific conviction. They assert, therefore, the existence of a real experience and one of a kind that surpasses all rational experience. If this experience is denied by some, like the rationalists, they say that this arises from the fact that such persons are unwilling to put themselves in the moral state necessary to produce it. It is this experience which makes the person who acquires it to be properly and truly a believer. How far this position is removed from that of Catholic teaching. We have already seen how its fallacies have been condemned by the Vatican Council. Later on, we shall see how these errors, combined with those which we have already mentioned, open wide the way to atheism. Here it is well to note at once that given this doctrine of experience, united with that of symbolism, every religion, even that of paganism, must be held to be true. What is to prevent such experiences from being found in any religion? In fact, that they are so is maintained by not a few. On what grounds can modernists deny the truth of an experience affirmed by a follower of Islam? Will they claim a monopoly of true experiences for Catholics alone? Indeed, modernists do not deny but actually maintain, some confusedly, others frankly, that all religions are true. That they cannot feel otherwise is obvious. For on what ground, according to their theories, could falsity be predicated of any religion whatsoever. Certainly, it would be either on account of the falsity of the religious sense or on account of the falsity of the formula pronounced by the mind. Now, the religious sense, although it may be more perfect or less perfect, is always one and the same. And the intellectual formula, in order to be true, has but to respond to the religious sense and to the believer whatever be the intellectual capacity of the latter. In the conflict between different religions, the most that modernists can maintain is that the Catholic has more truth because it is more vivid and that it deserves with more reason the name of Christian because it corresponds more fully with the origins of Christianity. No one will find it unreasonable that these consequences flow from the premises. But what is most amazing is that there are Catholics and priests who, we would fain believe, abhor such enormities and yet act as if they fully approved of them. For they lavish such praise and bestow such public honor on the teachers of these errors as to convey the belief that their admiration is not meant merely for the persons who are perhaps not devoid of a certain merit, but rather for the sake of the errors which these persons openly profess and which they do all in their power to propagate. Section heading, Religious Experience and Tradition. 
there is yet another element in this part of their teaching which is absolutely contrary to Catholic truth. For what is laid down as to experience is also applied with destructive effect to, tr to tradition which has always been maintained by the Catholic Church. Tradition, as understood by the modernists, is a communication with others of, a, of an original experience through preaching by means of the intellectual formula. To this formula, in addition to its representative value, they attribute a speeches of suggestive efficacy, which acts firstly in the believer by stimulating the religious sense, should it happen to have grown sluggish, and by renewing the experience once acquired, and secondly, in those who do not yet believe, by awakening in them, for the first time, the religious sense and producing the experience. In this way is religious experience spread abroad among the nations, and not merely among contemporaries by preaching, but among future generations both by books, by oral transmission from one to another. Sometimes this communication of, relig of religious experience takes root and thrives, at other times it withers at once and dies. For the modernists, to live is a proof of, of truth, since for them life and truth are one and the same thing. Thus we are once more led to infer that all existing religions are equally true, for otherwise they would not survive. Section heading, Faith and Science. We have proceeded sufficiently far, venerable brethren, to have before us enough, and more than enough, to enable us to see what are the relations which modernists establish between faith and science, including, as they are wont to do under that name, history. And in the first place, it is to be held that the object matter of the one is quite extraneous to and separate from the object matter of the other. For faith occupies itself solely with something which science declares to be, for it, unknowable. Hence, each has a separate scope assigned to it. Science is entirely concerned with phenomena into which faith does not at all enter. Faith, on the contrary, concerns itself with the divine, which is entirely unknown to science. That it, thus, it is contended that there can never be any dissension between faith and science. For if each keeps on its own ground, they can never meet, and therefore never can be in contradiction. And if it be objected that in the visible world there are some things which appertain to faith, such as the human life of Christ, the modernists reply by denying this. For though such things come within the category of phenomena, still, in as far as they are lived by faith, and in the way already described, have been by faith transfigured and disfigured, they have been removed from the world of sense and transferred into material for the divine. Hence, should it be further asked whether Christ has wrought real miracles and made real prophecies, whether he rose truly from the dead and ascended into heaven, the answer of agnostic science will be in the negative and the answer of faith in the affirmative. Yet there will not be on that account any conflict between them. For it will be denied by the philosopher, as a philosopher speaking to philosophers and considering Christ only in his historical reality, and it will be affirmed by the believer as a believer speaking to believers and considering the life of Christ as lived again by the faith and in the faith. Section heading. Faith subject to science. It would be a great mistake, nevertheless, to suppose that according to these theories, one is allowed to believe that faith and science are entirely independent of each other. On the side of science, that is indeed quite true and correct. But it is quite otherwise with regard to faith, which is subject to science, not on one, but on three grounds. For in the first place it must, be, it must be observed that in every religious fact, when one takes away the divine reality and the experience of it which the believer possesses, everything else, and especially the religious formulas, belongs to the sphere of phenomena and therefore falls under the control of science. 
Let the believer go out of the world if he will. But as long as he remains in it, whether he like it or not, he cannot escape from the laws, the observation, the judgments of science and of history. Further, although it is contended that God is the object of faith alone, the statement refers only to the divine reality, not to the idea of God. The latter also is subject to science, which, while it philosophizes in what is called the logical order, soars also to the absolute and the ideal. It is therefore the right of philosophy and of science to form its knowledge concerning the idea of God, to direct it in its evolution, and to purify it of any extraneous elements which may have entered into it. Hence we have the modernist axiom that the religious evolution ought to be brought into accord with the moral and intellectual, or as one whom they regard as their leader has expressed it, ought to be subject to it. Finally, man does not suffer a dualism to exist in himself, and the believer therefore feels within him an impelling need so to harmonize faith with science that it may never oppose the general conception which science sets forth concerning the universe. Thus, it is evident that science is to be entirely independent of faith, while on the other hand, and notwithstanding that they are supposed to be strangers to each other, faith is made subject to science. All this, venerable brothers, is in formal opposition to the teachings of our predecessor, Pius IX, where he lays it down that, quote, In matters of religion, it is the duty of philosophy not to command but to serve, not to prescribe what is to be believed, but to embrace what is to be believed with reasonable obedience, not to scrutinize the depths of the mysteries of God, but to venerate them devoutly and humbly. Unquote. The modernists completely invert the parts, and to them may be applied the words which another of our predecessors, Gregory the Ninth, addressed to some theologians of his time. Quote, some among you puffed up like bladders with a spirit of vanity, strive by profane novelties to cross the boundaries fixed by the fathers, twisting the meaning of the sacred text to the, philosophy, to the philosophical teaching of the rationalists, not for the profit of their hearer, but to make a show of science. These men, led away by various and strange doctrines, turn the head into the tail and force the queen to serve the handmaid. Unquote. Section heading, The Methods of Modernists. This will appear more clearly to anybody who studies the conduct of modernists, which is in perfect harmony with their teachings. In their writings and addresses, they seem not infrequently to advocate doctrines which are contrary one to the other so that one would be disposed to regard their attitude as double and doubtful. But this is done deliberately and advisedly, and the reason of it is to be found in their opinion as to the mutual separation of science and faith. Thus in their books one finds some things which might well be approved by a Catholic, but on turning over the page one is confronted by other things which might well have been dictated by a rationalist. When they write history, they make no mention of the divinity of Christ, but when they are in the pulpit, they profess it clearly. Again, when they are dealing with history, they take no account of the fathers and the councils, but when they catechize the people, they cite them respectfully. In the same way, they draw the distinctions between exegesis, which is theological and pastoral, and exegesis, which is scientific and historical. So too, when they treat of philosophy, history, and criticism, acting on the principle that science in no way depends upon faith, they feel no special horror in treading the footsteps of Luther, and are wont to display a manifold contempt for Catholic doctrines, for the Holy Fathers, for the ecumenical councils, for the ecclesiastical magisterium. And should they be taken to task for this, they complain that they are being deprived of their liberty. Lastly, maintaining the theory 
that faith must be subject to science, they continuously and openly rebuke the Church on the ground that she resolutely refuses to submit and accommodate her dogmas to the opinions of philosophy, while they, on their side, having for this purpose blotted out the old theology, endeavour to introduce a new theology which shall support the aberrations of philosophers. Section heading, The Modernist as Theologian, His Principles, Immanence and Symbolism. At this point, venerable brethren, the way is open for us to consider the modernists in the theological arena, a difficult task, yet one that may be disposed of briefly. It's a question of effecting the conciliation of faith with science, but always by making the one subject to the other. In this matter, the modernist theologian takes exactly the same principles which you have seen employed by the modernist philosopher, the principles of immanence and symbolism, and applies them to the believer. The process is an extremely simple one. The philosopher has declared the principle of faith is immanent, the believer has added this principle is God, and the theologian draws the conclusion God is immanent in man. Thus, we have theological immanence. So too, the philosopher regards it as certain that the representations of the object of faith are merely symbolical. The believer has likewise affirmed that the object of faith is God in himself, and the theologian proceeds to affirm that the representations of the divine reality are symbolical. And thus, we have theological symbolism. These errors are truly of the gravest kind, and the pernicious character of both will be seen clearly from an examination of their consequences. For to begin with symbolism, since symbols about symbols in regard to their objects and only instruments in regard to the believer, it is necessary first of all, according to the teachings of the modernists, that the believer do not lay too much stress on the formula as formula, but avail himself of it only for the purpose of uniting himself to the absolute truth which the formula at once reveals and conceals, that is to say, endeavours to express, but without ever succeeding in doing so. They would also have the believer make use of the formulas only in as far as they are helpful to him, for they are given to be a help and not a hindrance. With proper regard, however, for the social respect due to formulas which the public man magisterium has deemed suitable for expressing the common consciousness until such time as the same magisterium shall provide otherwise. Concerning immanence, it's not easy to, de to determine what modernists precisely mean by it, for their own opinions on the subject vary. Some understand it in the sense that God, working in man, is more intimately present in him than man is even in himself, and this conception, if properly understood, is irreproachable. Others hold that the divine action is one with the action of nature, as the action of the first cause is one with the action of the secondary cause, and this would destroy the supernatural order. Others, finally, explain it in a way which savours of pantheism, and this, in truth, is the sense which best fits in with the rest of their doctrines. With this principle of immanence is connected another which may be called the principle of divine permanence. It differs from the first in much the same way as the private experience differs from the experience transmitted by tradition. An example illustrating what is meant will be found in the Church and the Sacraments. The Church and the Sacraments, according to the modernists, are not to be regarded as having been instituted by Christ himself. This is barred by agnosticism, which recognizes in Christ nothing more than a man whose religious consciousness has been, like that of all men, formed by degrees. It's also barred by the law of immanence, which rejects what they call external application. It's further barred 
by the law of evolution, which requires for the development of the germs, time and a certain series of circumstances. It is, finally, barred by history, which shows that such in fact has been the course of things. Still, it is to be held that both church and sacraments have been founded immediately by Christ. But how? In this way. All Christian consciences wear their firm in a manner virtually included in the conscience of Christ as the plant is included in the seed. But as the branches live the life of the seed, so too all Christians are said to live the life of Christ. But the life of Christ, according to faith, is divine, and so too is the life of Christians. And if this life produced in the course of ages both the Church and the sacraments, it's quite right to say that their origin is from Christ and is divine. In the same way, they make out that the Holy Scriptures and the dogmas are divine. And in this, the modernist theology may be said to reach its completion. A slender provision in truth, but more than enough for the theologian who professes that the conclusions of science, whatever they may be, must always be accepted. No one will have any difficulty in making the application of these theories to the other points with which we propose to deal.